Hey everybody, are you interested in looking at the distilling process and pairing that with key business knowledge such as finance, marketing, and operations? Then you should check out the online Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's an online program and can be completed in as little as 15 weeks. It's taught by both U of L business faculty and corporate fellows, so you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. All that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash pursue spirits. I thought, you know, this could be almost like semi-retirement because once you start distilling, I mean, you just kind of sit around and watch barrels age, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I assumed would happen. Would be, <laughs> you know, I'd wander in, you know, at noon or something and... Get myself a glass, hang you know, out, yeah, talk to I some mean, people. You know, how hard could it be? You know, you're just going to watch these barrels get old. going on everybody it is episode 223 of bourbon pursuit i'm kenny one of your hosts and it's time for the bourbon news so let's get to it woodford reserve is releasing their fall 2019 masters collection it's a chocolate malted rye bourbon this limited edition and one-time release is offering a different flavoring technique where they toast the rye grain just long enough that it begins to taste like chocolate this bourbon will have a suggested retail price of $129.99. It has hints of, you guessed it, dark chocolate as well as spice coming in and at 90.4 proof. The completed mash bill will be 70% corn, 15% of the chocolate malted rye, and 15% of distiller's malt. Baker's Bourbon is getting a facelift and a rebranding as well as a new limited edition offering. This one sort of flew under the radar for a lot of people. It was first picked up almost a year ago by SKU through the TTB just kind of trolling through the website, but now people are starting to find it on the shelves. The Baker's bottles with the black wax that we once knew is going away, but there's going to be an upgraded packaging and a slightly higher price tag coming in as well. It is now changing from a small batch, 107 proof, to a single barrel, but still at 107 proof, but keeping a seven year age statement. There's also gonna be a limited edition, 13 year edition of Baker's that will have an adorning, a metallic inspired label, as well as a metal neck charm. We've seen pictures of them already out there, so keep your eyes peeled when you're going to the liquor stores. Travel and Leisure Magazine has reported that starting on Monday, October 21st, you will be able to rent Jim Beam's historic home on Airbnb. Beam Suntory will release a limited number of one night stays available for booking through the end of 2019. And each day is priced at just a mere $23. And this marks the same exact price as a bottle of Jim Beam Black Bourbon. The only catch is that you have to be 21 years or older to stay inside the home. But inside this historic home, you're going to have three bedrooms as well as two and a half bathrooms, and it overlooks the beautiful Everbach Lake. And it comes stocked with a full bar of Jim Beam bourbons. You can read more about it with the link in our show notes. New Rip is a name that's become synonymous with bourbon lovers. And you may recall our conversation with Jay Arisman, who's the vice president back on episode 72. But this time, we get to speak with Ken Lewis, who drives a bunch of the decision-making behind the company. It almost feels like an episode of How I Built This, as we get to hear Ken's story of owning and hustling liquor stores to eventually selling out a lot of that and to start a distillery, hiring some great people. And as most of these stories go, it's just a few strokes of good luck to put him in the position where he is today. Then we wrap it up by getting to hear some of the future plans he has in store for New Riff as well. All right, now let's get to it. Here's Joe from Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hey everyone, Joe here again. In 2013, I launched Barrelcraft Spirits without a distillery and defied conventional wisdom. To this day, my team and I source and blend exceptional barrels from established producers and bottle at cast strength. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Patreon supporter Bill Nall. Bill asked, Give me an overview of the production in other states. Who is making their own juice? When did they start? Is Kentucky bourbon better? Pick five states and highlight the top distiller in each one. Well, I think it makes most sense to take a look at the states that are bordering Kentucky. The states that are bordering Kentucky have the ability to actually pluck talent from the distilling capital of the United States, and that, that is Kentucky. There's no question about that. 
And you also have access to the still makers and the and the training and you know places that are close to Kentucky can you know quickly drive down here and learn from the likes of Vendome or Independent Stave, etc., etc., etc. To the access to talent that puts Indiana right up there, and of course Indiana has the MGP Ingredients Distillery that has you know goes back to the 1800s. It's in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, a former Seagram's plant. And I dare say, you know, their bourbon rivals Kentucky's on a regular basis. Indiana is also home to, you know, upstarts like Cardinal Spirits that are very exciting. So Indiana is definitely on that top five list for me. Tennessee, obviously, it's known for Jack Daniels, but we can't underlook like some of the other great whiskey coming out of there. Whether you like the style or not, George Dickel is putting a lot of uh, bourbon out onto the market, um, either through you know source purveyors or under their own label, and it's getting a lot of attention, winning a lot of awards. You also have Charlie Nelson's uh, Greenbrier Distillery, Uncle Nearest is coming on, uh, Corsairs in Tennessee. So Tennessee is a state that is a no-brainer to put in this top five. Now, when you get outside of the states that really border Kentucky and are, are, are really growing on, you know, distilling-wise, Texas stands out to me in a big, big way. Texas is a state that really, they support anything from Texas. Uh, Texans are, are, are very proud of their state. And so if there's a Texas whiskey, it's selling out on those local stores. Whether it's good or not, it's got the brand of Texas on it, and people want that. That said, I think Balcones kind of stands out as as the best from a from a quality perspective. Garrison's Brothers does really well in blind tastings too. So Texas is one to keep your eye on. The one problem with Texas is they um, sometimes struggle with, you know, water resources. So here's the hope and they get a lot of good rain and they can apply that to making good whiskey. I think Colorado is another one of those states that's fascinating. Colorado really didn't come on until, you know, until the last decade. You've got Breckenridge there, but a distillery that's really fascinating to me is 291. 291's uh, ran by this guy named Michael Myers. No affiliation with, um, you know, the Halloween guy, but he's a former fashion photographer, and um, he went from having a, a whiskey on the market that was just kind of so-so to really improving it. So he's one of the most improved distillers that I've tasted uh, in my career. And so he's done a nice, nice job of building that brand in uh, in Colorado. And he finishes in Aspen Staves. And I tell you what, it, it, it's a fascinating flavor. So I think 291 is an exciting story of um, from uh, from point A to point B. So I'm excited to see where they, where they go next. Now, rounding out this list, um, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to pluck into the historical database of my brain in some ways, and say that New York is an extremely, extremely important state for the growth and rise of craft distilling, period. When Tuttletown hit the scene in the early 2000s with uh, Hudson Baby Bourbon, nobody really understood bourbon. It was not a time, it's not like today where we had all these forums and people were talking about it and there were podcasts and everything. This was a time when people still thought bourbon had to be made in Kentucky. So what Hudson Baby Bourbon did for the conversation of bourbon just in general is it allowed people to talk about, whoa, wait, bourbon doesn't have to be made in Kentucky. It can be made in New York. It can be made in Colorado. It can be made anywhere in the United States. And so that uh, Hudson Baby Bourbon and New York opened a lot of doors for people. So that's my list, Bill. Tennessee, Indiana, Texas. Colorado, New York. And if you guys have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Patreon. That's at Bourbon Pursuit on Patreon or on Instagram or Twitter at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny riding solo today, coming to Northern Kentucky in the Covington area with a uh, a brand owner that you know this is this is one of the brands that have really started to get, garner a lot of national attention um, they were once known for OKI we had a few other people on the podcast uh, I think it was like two years ago now and 
I'm now coming back because this this brand is starting to blow up so much, and it's amazing that the the national attention has been getting at just a four year product. And we're going to talk about that a lot more in depth because today on the show we have the owner Ken Lewis. So Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kenny. Appreciate it. So what do you go by? Do you just go by owner, the entrepreneur, the um, you know when the head man in charge? Yeah, I'm all check writer. That's my main function. It seems like. Uh, Founder, you mm-hmm. know, owner, yeah. So you've been you're you're kind of a serial entrepreneur, a serial yeah. owner. Yeah, you know, I think so. Uh-huh. This isn't your first uh, venture into not only just the the liquor business, but you've done something. Have you? Let's talk about before sure. Party Source. Like, was there was there a time before then where you're doing sort of entrepreneurial things? Absolutely. Well, I started in in the alcohol business, and and uh, I sort of hate to date myself, but it's a fact. Uh, uh, in 1975, so I was 25 years old. So been around the business my entire career. I fell into it at that time, um, but I found that I really enjoyed uh, entrepreneurship and the alcohol industry in general. And I just kept growing with it because that's kind of what I like to do: is, is grow a brand or grow a business, and taking some side steps. But they've always been in alcoholic beverages. So, so what was that that first venture into the alcohol well i i uh the the story real quickly because it's a cute story but a true story is i was actually an english teacher in high school for two years out of graduate school and my wife wanted to go to medical school and we didn't have the money and but that was okay too and i was not living i'm a native louisvillian but i wasn't living in louisville at the time i was in in the detroit area in the suburbs so uh my father had brought his brother to louisville and had been successful at uh what was the predecessors of uh, discount department stores. You know, Walmart, before there was Walmart, there was a chain in every city. My dad had gone from World War II into surplus military and had then gone into discount department store. Anyway, he had a very excellent location, and it was alcohol was fair traded. The state set the prices. It was kind of a no-brainer business. You just sort of showed up, and if you had a good location, it was pretty easy. So uh, People drink when good times ain't in bad. Good times and bad, and, and, and you just needed a good location. So uh, he set up my uncle. He was trying to help him out um, with this wonderful location for a, a real small uh, liquor store. Um, and my uncle turned out to be a, uh, uh, a drunk, a uh, thief. Uh, he was a womanizer and he was definitely a gambler. So his idea of running a business was to <laughs> show he, up. I think he hit every single one of the Cardinals. Well, right yeah, <laughs> he, he was good at that. And he was an all around jerk too. So, uh, anyway, he, um, he, his idea of running a business was to come in in the morning at like six thirty in the morning, take whatever cash he could out of the cash register and a bottle for the day and then disappear. Well, needless to say, after about, no matter how easy the business is with that kind of approach, after eight or nine months, the business had failed and it was shuttered. And my dad said, you know, this is a no brainer. Why don't you come to town, quit teaching for one year, take over this liquor store. I'm sure you can make enough money maybe to, to send your wife to medical school. And, you know, you can go back to teaching, you know, you can do this as a side gig. So he didn't use the word gig. That was that's definitely not a uh, 1975 word. But anyway, um, I did it and I said, why not? And so he loaned me enough to get started. And um, I really enjoyed it. I loved um, I loved the people part of it. I love retailing. Um, It was it was in the West End, uh, African-American area of of, uh, in blue collar area of Louisville. I loved learning, you know, just about people and what they were doing. It was before urban renewal. So the very intact communities. And I felt that they made me feel a part of the community. I just I feel like it was uh, my street education. And I was there for seven or eight years. I paid my dad back after one year. I was so proud. And um, I never went back to teaching. And just stayed in the alcohol industry. So that's my creation myth. And so your dad was the store owner at the time and he told you to run it? Is that what it was? No, no, he he owned the discount department store that was right next door that generated the traffic that made it such a great location. But we were right on the corner, you know, with our own independent little store. Mm -hmm. And And it was like 1,500 square feet, so a tiny little store. And I just kept going. And then uh, without trying to be too boring here, uh, oh, this isn't after, boring. This after is all, seven it's all eight, about how I built this. Well, sort of after thing. seven or eight years, uh, Kentucky uh, eliminated fair trade or was eliminated through a court case because the state was actually setting prices for private enterprise. So it was thrown out and no one knew what to do. So I said, what the heck, I'll, I'll do something. So at that time, the, the trend in retail was big box stores. Um, you know, maybe there are a few of your 
older listeners that will remember that. You know, it's just cut cases, buy cheap, buy on deal, cut the cases, no frills, and let the consumer just come in and save money. And it was a big trend. And um, I said, well, let's try that with alcohol. No one else was doing anything mm-hmm. in Kentucky. So I, I found this old AMP in Shively, another blue collar area of Louisville, and I rented the whole place. And um, I started this, uh, I started like in September, and it was not going so well. I mean, I was doing okay, but uh, was, wasn't gaining much traction. My uh, all, everybody was interested in the industry and what I was doing and not very happy because, you know, people want to keep preserve the past and they mm-hmm. didn't like this young upstart with new ideas for the alcohol industry. So everybody was watching me like a hawk. And we also had the first uh, uh, PC in the small business that I knew of in Louisville. And uh, in order to, because we had a fair number of SKUs, even, even uh, for those... Uh, you know, even compared to today, we still had a fair number of SKUs. So the computer was the only way at retail to, to manage them. And I was doing all the data input and everything. I was working, you know, 18 hours a day. And we had a law in Kentucky, and I'm sure it still is, that you cannot sell below cost. Accidentally, I was so tired, sometimes I made mistakes. And mm-hmm. and I would sell, a, you know, I would actually put into the computer the, the cost instead of the price or something. Yeah. So accidentally, I was selling a few items below cost. You're, like, the, a, you're like a consumer's, like... Perfect, perfect storm. Right yeah, there. you could come in. You know, talk about looking for dusties. You could just come in looking for deals. So, um, anyway, it's, competitors were watching me. They noticed that. They turned me into the state ABC board. And this is a magical story, and it's absolutely a true story. So, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, the Courier Journal, the the, the big newspaper of Louisville, uh, was doing a, a story. I'm sure it was going to end up on you know right next to the obituaries or something. <laughs> a nothing story, but they were in the building with a photographer, and just at that moment on a Saturday morning, the state ABC showed up with three armed officers. And while the photographer and the Courier Journal reporter were there, they literally arrested me and handcuffed me for selling alcohol below cost. And this ended up on the Sunday before Thanksgiving on the front page of the Courier Journal with some headline like, Young Entrepreneur. Uh, blows away the liquor industry selling products too cheap and it gets <laughs> it's like, arrested it's amazing that you get arrested for that well and, and it was ridiculous because you know within one hour they they were you know somebody the supervisor was apologizing and they let me go and it ended up like three months later i paid like a 50 dollars fine and you know it was no problem but it put me on the front page of the newspaper and then of course all the suburbanites couldn't get there fast enough and it was thanksgiving and we were we were a success from that point point. and tell me you have that newspaper like framed somewhere in your yeah, house. Yeah, I, I think that actually I don't have it on a wall and I've, I've actually tried to research it and I, I, I'll have to be more diligent. But anyway, it's a, it's a true story. We got started and then that grew into a chain at one point of six discount uh, liquor stores in the state of Kentucky and northern Kentucky and four, two up here and four in Louisville. Um, it was a big chain and just to conclude the story, about, I lose track of time, but maybe 12, 14 years ago, I was really very tired of being a corporate person. I'm not born to do that. I like being on the street. I like being in a register. I like, you know, being in the, in the trenches and I wasn't happy. I had like 350 employees and you know, a lot of debt, all that's kinds a, of debt. That's a lot. That's a lot to manage. Yeah, It was a lot to manage two cities and, 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 you know, so I was dealing with lawyers and, and bankers and all the problems, personnel problems that got big and blown up, got to my desk and I wasn't doing, I was unhappy. Uh, and so I, I like to express it as I jumped off the capitalist train Mm -hmm. and I sold five of the six stores because I really liked running a store and I kept the party source in Bellevue, Newport, right next to Cincinnati. And And what was the reason for that? Was it because it was a very high traffic, high volume or was it because you're like, I need to get a change out of Louisville? What was the... Precisely. Very pressing on your, on your part because that's exactly the two reasons. So... Uh, I felt it had the best future because Ohio still 25 years ago had state stores. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and so it was a no brainer if you were very, very close. And we were at the first exit of the main, main interstate, interstate of, uh, of the East end of Cincinnati. And, uh, we were doing extremely well and I thought it could grow and be an even greater store. So I wanted to focus on it. And secondly, it was a hundred miles from Louisville. So I'd stop working seven days a week because I had a family, I had children. So, um, those are the two reasons that I kept it. And I love that store and the party source today. I'm happy to say is the, uh, we, we say that we believe it to be the largest single, uh, store in the United States, alcoholic beverage store physically and does today about $48 million in business. But of course I had to divest it 
five years ago in order to become a distiller. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I sold it to my employees. I'm very proud of that. And they're doing very well today and have paid me back. And, um, and it's, it's moving forward. It's still a great store. So while you were still on the, the retail side, was there ever a point where you had any mild regrets or saying like, what if, if I didn't get rid of these, these five locations, like could have grown bigger? Could I have gotten, I mean, cause if you think of today of what's happening, you've got the total wines of the world that are yeah. trying to buy up people. Like, is right. there, is there ever that kind of what if scenario in your head? No, because, and that, that just gets into personal philosophy. Uh, you know, the point of life to me is not just to become rich. Uh, I think the, uh, I think that's the root of a lot of problems today in corporate America and, and, and with our society in general, there's too much greed and, and it's all about me. So I, I enjoyed the entrepreneurial challenge and I liked working with people, a young team of employees as well as the customers. And I love the freedom of owning my own store. And at that point, you know, selling five of them, I was debt free. So I could do what I wanted to do in the store and not have to do any short term thinking. Um, and so never look back. I have, I, I'm happy to say I've always had a, um, you know, very nice upper middle class lifestyle and by God, that's enough. I mean, having some control over your life and, and feeling that you're doing some good and that you're changing some lives of your employees and being a good community member and caring about the environment and, you know, having some balance in life and purpose and meeting, not just trying to make money and get bigger and bigger and bigger and die rich. That never had any attraction to me. So you're, you're running one of the, the states, not only just the state, because you're here, as you said, you're the first exit off of the coming off from Cincinnati in mm -hmm. Kentucky. Yes. And it was it, for a lot of people, it's, it's a destination, it is uh, a destination. Lo, uh, retail location. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're also, like I said, it's huge. Um, you're competing with the liquor barns in Louisville at this time. What was what was the determining factor to say I'm I'm ready to hang this up and move to something new? Well, and the liquor barns in Louisville were, were the original four of them were uh, three of them were my my stores. Okay, so, so there we go. <laughs> you know, so I mean the the circle goes around, but and they're a good customer today and a valued customer of us today. Um, the motivation, Kenny, was just um, sometimes we do things unconsciously. Our subconscious takes over, and just as whatever it was, 12, 14, 15 years ago, I was just not happy. And I call it my 71 aha moment because 71 is the road between Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky and Louisville. And I was on it a lot and then, you know, had a lot of time to think. And, um, you know, it just, I wasn't happy and I wanted to make a change. And I think subconsciously I knew that I was a little bit of a burnout. I had been doing it at that point, retailing, which is a very, very, very hard work and it is. six, seven days a week and, you know, all the holidays and so forth. So, uh, and, and fairly repetitious, you know, I was a buyer, I was a spirits buyer as well as the owner and it's just a drill and it's a, you know, a wonderful drill and I loved it. Uh, but it's intense and deals are coming at you and there's a lot of paperwork and, uh, and it's a routine that goes on and on and on. So I think subconsciously I was a little bit of a burnout at that point and I didn't want to retire. Uh, I, I love working and, uh, feel that it's healthy for the mind. And I think retirement is like announcing to your body that you're ready to die or something. So <laughs> I really do believe that. And so I was not at all interested in any of that. Um, so, uh, you Jay know, Arisman, you know, most people just get a Porsche. That's usually what they'll see, do. And then, you know, everybody thinks, Oh, I mean, when I sold the, you have no idea what people th said to me and what th I know what they were not saying to me, you know, the, the, they were, completely astonished and befuddled that a guy would take the party source doing $40 million a year debt free, you know, just a, a gravy train and not just like retire to a beach, you know, in Florida or something and let a manager run it at least, but to sell it, you know, and sell it to the employees, you know, and take that risk on top of everything else was go into the, the spirits business, build a distillery madness, absolute madness. But, um, uh, Anyway, Jay Erisman is my wonderful, fantastic, well-known. A lot of your uh, uh, folks, listeners, will know who Jay Erisman is. So he's my co-founder. I like to think of him that way, although he's not in ownership. Uh, and Jay was my fine spirits buyer, the specialty spirits buyer at the Party Source. So he's worked for me for many years. And jokingly, he used to say, you know, Ken, we're both watching this brown goods revolution happening and resurgence and resurrection right under our nose. We see it at the party source every day of our lives. Uh, this thing's got legs. Um, so I credit Jay with, you know, why don't we open a distillery? 
Yeah, oh, that's a great idea. Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah. Got the any more good, cost got any more good ones? You yeah. know, here we are running the party source. You know, sh you know, trucking money to the bank. Oh, that's a great idea, Jay. Well, along the way, it became a little more serious. So I do credit Jay and not myself with the idea for starting uh, New Rift Distilling. Uh, but it was it just appealed to my entrepreneurial uh, side of me and the challenge aspect to get back into the game and and see what I could create and what my lifetime of experience in alcoholic beverages could do. And I love the idea of the challenge of starting from the ground up and building a team of young people, uh, which has occurred and they're fantastic. And I just really wanted to uh, have a second act in my life. And I actually, and I'll tell you honestly, I, I thought, you know, this could be almost like semi-retirement because once you start distilling, I mean, you just kind of sit around and watch barrels age, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I assumed would happen. It would be, <laughs> you know, I'd wander in, you know, at noon or something and give myself a glass, hang you know, out, yeah, talk to I some mean, people. You know, how hard could it be? You know, you're just going to watch these barrels get old. So, of course, it's proven to be way more challenging, way more dynamic, and way more interesting than, than any of that. But that was the impetus was being at the party source, seeing it happen, realizing that why not Northern Kentucky? All the action, the limited action there was seven or eight years ago was all in Central Kentucky and just starting in Louisville. You know, why not Northern Kentucky? Because we're right next to a city that's more than twice as large as Louisville, very wealthy city and a sophisticated city. And, you know, and the party source had done so well right next to Cincinnati. Why wouldn't a distillery? So we or I decided to go ahead and take on the challenge and sell the party source and get back out there on the on, in a risk position where I just feel comfortable in a way that most people don't. So you decide to sell the party source. Was this because you needed the funds to be able to start the distillery? Or was that, or is there another motivating factor? Well, there? the main reason is in, in the three-tier system, you cannot be a distiller or a manufacturer and a retailer or a wholesaler. The, 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 that's what the three-tier means. They can't mm -hmm. cross. You can't be both. Well, you can't I've be also both. heard you could probably put your wife's name under the contract you know, and then you could get around uh, it. You, you, I mean, that's another legal hurdle. Real, but. Yeah, but but it's not true in Kentucky, and it is true in some other states. For mm -hmm. instance, New York has a one-store law, and there's plenty of families that have four or five stores. But that is not true in Kentucky, and we are way too big and way too visible to play any shenanigans with the ABC. And too much is way too much is invested in at risk to Absolutely. take any of that on. So. Um, and I thought it was a great thing selling the store to the employees. And, you know, I take, you know, when all is said and done, I'll, I'll be very, very, very pleased with the success and the reputation and the great whiskey of New Rift. But I also will be proud that I've changed 100 or 200 lives and giving them some, some pride and some self, some control over their lives as employees in an employee-owned company and a little nest egg. You know, I, I said when I retired, when I sold the store and my general manager, John Stiles, who's a fantastic guy, took, a, took it over so we had an experienced management team. I said, there's only one thing I want. As long as I'm alive, when someone retires and they're getting like a six-figure check, even if it's just one of those big checks, you know, for show, mm -hmm. I want to hand, hand the check to that employee. That's what I want out of this deal because... We're talking about, you know, $15, $16 an hour employees. Maybe someday if things go well, and they seem to be after 20 years, someone might be handing them a six-figure retirement, you know, for people that are living paycheck to paycheck. And yeah. I, I want to be... I want to be when that magic there when that magic moment happens. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're really wrapping up the epitome of what it is to be a, a better than, than most of the entrepreneurs that are out there that are after chasing that, that big paycheck or exactly. chasing that big payday. Your personality is really showing through that it's, uh, you're one of the, the good spirited people that are out there and, and trying to build something that's, that's ultimately bigger than yourself. So yeah. it's and, great and to see. And there's many other people, and I don't want to get on a tangent, but uh, there's a big movement in the United States uh, called a lot of things, but uh, there's chapters all over the United States called Conscious Capitalism. You know, and again, I don't want to get into a tangent. It's not a, <laughs> we want to talk about bourbon. But uh, the, the idea that capitalism doesn't have to be as raw and just and greedy and selfish, and that you can care about the community, you can care about your employees, you can care about the environment, and that the bottom line should involve all of those stakeholders, not just ownership. So let's let's get back to bourbon. Let's let's definitely <laughs> get back to bourbon. Kind of talk about your your introduction to it as well, because I think we we need to capture that because you know you had this very entrepreneurial mind going into it. Jay said, "Hey, there's this brown water revolution," but yes. Was there a point when you said, like, you know, like, 
you know, I'm from Kentucky. I enjoy bourbon. I like bourbon. Um, you've worked in the stores where you were pushing bourbon to people or people to bourbon. Like, kind of talk about your gravitation just towards the product itself. Sure. And I'll be dead honest about all this. Uh, first of all, Jay and I are a great pair in that as co-founders because Jay is a has a tremendous palate and he's also a tremendous historian of alcoholic beverages around the world and he was a fine spirits buyer and he would sleuth out things that you know people in the midwest certainly other than the two coasts had never heard of and brought in so and he knew, he has a network of people he knows around the world so jay brings to new riff the great depth and honest depth of uh, knowledge and a profound palate and, and sophistication about alcoholic beverages to, to our company. I don't bring any of that. <laughs> you know, I mean, at the, at the party source, we are a phenomenal wine store, and I'm a knowledgeable amateur. And that's my extent of it. So I feel I'm a knowledgeable amateur about uh, brown goods, um, but no expert, do not have a refined palate. I know my place, and that's good, too. Uh, so that's what I, br I bring to the team. Of course, the found uh, the mm -hmm. the financial aspect and the team building and the the long term strategy and perspective of where the industry is going and so forth. So we're a very good team together. So uh, I think that's been uh, a core of how we've you know started New Riff and and where we wanted to go with it. Can you remember your first taste of bourbon? Uh, my first taste of bourbon was probably like a lot of a lot of your listeners. It was, and I do remember, unfortunately, it was in the back seat of a car when I was like <laughs> we all, 17 we all, years old. We all know old. where this is going. And it was, yeah, all bad. And it was, I'll never forget, it was J.W. Dant in a pint bottle and drank it straight. And you know what happened uh -huh. in the back seat of that car, which I spent about three hours terribly drunk and unhappy cleaning up before I turned it back to my dad. <laughs> so hoping he would never know. Of course, he knew instantly. But that was my first bourbon experience, like I'm sure many of your listeners. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about, um, you know, the breaking of the ground and trying to build the team here. I know you've talked about Jay and bringing him in, but what did it take to find um, the still, the, the distillers, everything like that to actually start getting the business off the ground and sure. uh, as well as sourcing, because I know you had sourced product in yes. the very beginning too. Well, the wonderful, yes. I mean, again, we, Jay and I are a good team and, and, and I think in, in some ways I'm a good leader and founder because I know my own weaknesses and, and I know what I don't know, which is a famous line uh, from the past, know what you don't know. Um, and so when we started, we decided to approach this as a very serious enterprise. We decided to approach it at scale, that we would command the presence of uh, greater Cincinnati and tend to preclude competition from coming in. Um, our goal from the very beginning was to be one of the great small distilleries of the world, knowing that would take decades perhaps to accomplish, and who knows, it'll be a self-congratulatory thing, no one's going to anoint us that, but to play in the sandlot of some of the great distilleries of the world, small ones, uh, is our goal and remains to this day our goal. And so in order to do that, we wanted to do everything extremely well right from the beginning and put the resources, which I felt we had with the selling of the party source, uh, to work to... Uh, to wait as long as we needed to, four or five years, to start bringing out whiskey, and to just go for it in terms of quality and our, our uh, and, and to find a leadership position as a small distillery in the United States. So knowing that, uh, we went out, or I went out and found some great people to get started. And Kentucky is a wonderful resource. The best the thing that I did, I did two great things. One is, one of my very first hires after Jay was um, the person who would maintain our plant manager. <laughs> mm -hmm. so that he was involved with the construction and every aspect of planning and knew where every pipe was going. And I think that's something that's overlooked by a lot of people is, 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 you know, is the, the, the guts and the fabric and the, the core and the maintenance of, your, of, of, your, of a very complex manufacturing plant. I knew enough to know to hire a great person, and he's with us, Dean, today, and he does a super job. Dean was uh, actually helping us earlier, trying to get the AC turned off yeah, in here. He, so he's he's a, knows, he knows literally He knows everything. everything. He knows where all the skeletons are, but, I mean, he knows where every valve is and every pipe, and he was part of the construction crew for the year and a half, and the whole thing it was money very well spent. Second thing I did was I uh, found Larry Ebersold, who's a the, maybe the, the most important uh, distiller of American 
history that, that many people have never heard of. Um, and Larry was the plant manager at Seagram's, as you well know, Kenny, uh, for 25 plus years. Uh, the head distiller, I misspoke, the head distiller at Seagram's, and he's the guy that invented the famous 95.5 um, rye recipe that, you know, right, I don't absolutely. know what the percentage is, but it used to be it's half or there. more of uh, what's, what is seen on the shelf, and it's wonderful juice. And Larry uh, is a brilliant, brilliant distiller and a wonderful human being. I count him as a good friend. And he was newly retired and living in Hebron, which is near the Cincinnati airport, which is in Kentucky. And uh, so he's only like 20 miles away. And uh, was contemplating, it turned out, being a consultant, sort of didn't know how to get started at it. It was in his so, backyard. It was easy, yeah, it was it was easy for him. Yeah, great. And so we were a wonderful thing. So he really threw himself into it. Uh, best thing I ever did. And with Larry being involved from the very beginning, we knew we would construct, and we did construct, a very efficient, a very, very uh, well thought through distillery um, and not make some of the mistakes that are easy to make. Uh, and secondly, and perhaps in the long run, more, well, definitely more important in the long run, with Larry on board as our consulting master distiller, he would train my distilling team, which gave me the freedom to pick with his approval who would be on that distilling team. And I very deliberately, and with Jay's advice in this regard too, we did not go to Maker's Mark or Heaven Hill or Four Roses and hire away an assistant distiller, which is the standard procedure, because in the end, distillers do the same thing day after day. And, and forgive me, I don't mean to ruffle any feathers. Traditionally, at least, they don't tend to be a very imaginative lot in general. <laughs> and don't, For, don't, forgive me. Don't break what's, or don't, don't fix what's not exactly. broken. Exactly. Yeah. And people want to, you want Maker's Mark. You don't want Maker's Mark with uh, cream cheese on it. You know, it's, it's, it's appropriate and it's what the, the, the corporations want. So you, if we hired someone for Maker's Mark, we'd end up with Maker's Mark North. And in truth, that's what happens, you know, when, when uh, folks go from distillery to distillery. So, uh, what I knew, and with Jay's help, I, I knew, I wouldn't have known this on my own, uh, and, and Larry too, fermentation is the key. And distillers tend to poo-poo, traditional distillers tend to poo-poo poo -poo, uh, fermentation. They don't pay that much attention to it. But fermentation, if you don't have a great fermentation, you're not going to end up with great whiskey in the end. The, people, the folks that really understand this are brewers. Absolutely. The That's, beer people, they know what they're doing. They know. So we deliberately went out and hired a fantastic brewer. In this case, it was Brian Sprantz, who will absolutely be known, if he's not already, to so many people as a great young distiller and will truly be in the Hall of Fame someday. And Brian had been a small, small brewer uh, with a microbrewery in Cincinnati and for about eight years had worked at Sam Adams. And I'm not sure how many people know that Sam Adams is brewed in Cincinnati, not in Boston. Oh, we'll see. I'm learning something today. And it is. It's the old Hudipole plant. And 95% of Sam Adams is brewed in Cincinnati. Now, that name I've heard of, the Hudipole, because it's yeah. like a northern Kentucky kind of... Well, uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati it's kind of beer, yeah. Cincinnati, but, but the plant was closed. And, and uh, anyway, so Sam Adams owns it. So he worked for Sam Adams over there in a serious industrial plant. So he brought to us when I hired him, and he wanted out because he's not a corporate kind of guy, and he wanted to get back into you know brewing, so to speak, or you know the guts of doing it, not just the big industrial. And it was a unionized plant; it is to this day a unionized plant. He wanted a different scale, so we found you know we know so many people in Kentucky and Cincinnati. We found Brian and recruited him. It wasn't very hard. He was <laughs> eager to eager to come and eager to take the challenge when he saw how real we were, and to be part of a startup. And he just brought that fantastic uh, imagination and knowledge of fermentation and, and understanding of grains and malts that traditional distillers are just very linear and very uh, blinders on. Yeah, it's, it's, so, you and, get your, your percentages, you throw in your yeast, yeah, we'll see in a few days. Yeah, consistency, yeah. Well, every day, do it every day. And they make some great whiskey at all mm -hmm. these heritage distilleries. Believe me, I totally uh, understand that. But we wanted to do a, a little, our riff, our, our own little tweaks and things. And with Larry able to train, it gave us the freedom to assemble that team. So no one in the distillery, other than Larry, uh, had ever worked in a distillery before. But with Larry there, we did it as a team, and we have a fantastic group of uh, six distillers today, and they're all career. They're all doing a super job. And Larry, as he trained them, he stepped back. And that's just, he's, he was, he's our founding father in many ways. 
And Larry was very, is a, obviously very rye centric. It was the 95.5 rye that he was so proud of. And so, and we happened to fit our tastes as well. So New Riff is truly a rye centric distillery. And I will, I've said this many times, we make fantastic bourbon, but I think our long-term reputation becoming one of the great small distilleries of the world will have a lot to do with, with rye. And rye is a fan, interesting niche that I, I, I think we can play in that sandlot very, very well and be extremely well known around the world for our rye and maybe stay a little bit away from the great heritage global distilleries you know, in the future because you're, we're all going to need a niche. So did Larry help you out with choosing the mash bills as well for everything you were doing or is that more of a consensus from the group? There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever. So how do you find out the best stories and the best flavors? Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club, it's a Whiskey of the Month club, and they are on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 40 states. And Rackhouse's October box, they're featuring a distillery with an interesting ingredient, water from the Bull Run watershed that has been protected by Congress since the 1870s. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two bottles for the Bull Run Distilling Company out of Portland, Oregon, including a Pinot Noir finished American whiskey. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. 291 Colorado Whiskey aims to create a one-of-a-kind, bold and beautiful Colorado whiskey. Rugged, refined, rebellious. Distillery 291 is an award-winning, small-batch whiskey distillery located in Colorado Springs, Colorado, nestled in the shadow of Pikes Peak. Owner and founding distiller Michael Myers grew up on family farms in Georgia and Tennessee, across the countryside defined by rolling hills, horses, and whiskey. He set out to create a flagship whiskey that evoked the Wild West, a cowboy walking to a bar saying, give me a whiskey, and the bartender slamming down a bottle, a bottle of 291 Colorado whiskey. Find a bottle near you at 291coloradowhiskey.com. Ride it like you stole it, drink it like you own it. Live fast, drink responsibly. So did Larry help you out with choosing the mash bills as well for everything you were doing, or is that more of a consensus from the group? Uh, Larry was the leader of making those decisions, but it was a, it was part of the education of the distilling team to, uh, with Jay Erisman. Mm-hmm. So yes, very much our leader of the committee, if you will, that originally picked our mash bills. Now, it's taken over by our distilling team and Brian now, and Larry likes to come and, and taste and, and offer some thoughts. If we run into something every now and then that's really past our abilities, we call Larry and he, he you know, he really thinks very fondly of us and we were his first client and, and I think he's enjoying our, our growth and, and is very optimistic about our future. So, Well, before we start talking about, you know, a lot about your bourbon, because I know you're doing crazy stuff with barrels and types of grains and malts and stuff like that, let's talk about the, the OKI days, because I know sure. you were sourcing at one point. What was the, um, it was the just, I mean, that's the thought process that a lot of startups go through and they think, okay, well, let's get money rolling in. We'll buy some barrels, we'll bottle it up, and that'll be a way to kind of build some revenue. Is that Was that your thought process going into it as well? No. Uh, so, um, well, at least you're frank about it. Yeah, no, I'll always be frank. I mean, the nice thing is you're dealing with the owner. I don't have any anybody I have to answer to, and I'm getting older, so I'm pretty pretty straightforward. Um, no, the answer was we were going for quality, and we knew. I mean, remember, I've, I, you know, I own the largest liquor store in the United States. I was a spirits buyer. I I saw the chicanery. I saw the dishonesty of the of uh, the brown goods business. I I hated all of it, and saw it from the beginning the 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 uh, not disclosing not disclosing your source uh, charging too much uh, you know in a pretty perfume bottle for one year old whiskey and and uh, you know hurting the reputation of all craft distilleries i saw all the the bad things that have happened and continue to happen in this industry so we wanted no part of it that's not how you build a great small distillery of the world so from the beginning we were always going to be transparent and incredibly open with everyone about everything we did i had fortuitously bought at jay's urging 350 barrels uh from mgp years a couple of years before we even thought about the distillery concept oh so wow so that i was... had i had yeah it's just uh, you know we'll bottle this someday for the party source 
And so I, you know, I, I, I wish, of course, I had bought thousands, but because <laughs> I, I hate to tell you, they were like, I, I really hate to say this, they were like three hundred seventy-five dollars a barrel. Oh man! And you know, I, we've, today, seen the, we've seen the price list I now. Mean, yeah. Thousands and thousands of dollars, if you could even yeah. get them, and they were already like three years old when I bought them. So fortuitously, I had those barrels, and we never bought any other barrels. So it was only three hundred fifty, and uh, the idea of having those barrels and and OKI. We deliberately released it very, very slowly. The idea was just to have some bourbon in the distillery, a good bourbon, because it's it's marketing and brand building. People come to the distillery, like New Riff, when it's two years old, they know intellectually that we're too young to have great whiskey, but they still want to taste great whiskey. They still think you should have a, a fine old bourbon sitting around. So we did, and we were very clear it was OKI that we sourced it. Uh, it wasn't ours. We had just bottled it, uh, dumped it and bottled it, and we deliberately rationed it out to last until our bourbon was available. And then we always intended, and we did, kill the brand because we, have, we don't want to have anything to do with source goods. So it served its purpose extremely well. And then, as you well know, Kenny, in the end, when it was 12 years old, it was a terrific value. And when people heard that it was ending, you know, it became a cult item, and they went crazy about it, and it's still a little bit of one of those legendary things. But the purpose was never to have any source goods, and the, the sales of 300 or so barrels, you know, for the size of New Rift, never moved the needle as far as helping us to survive. We, mm-hmm. we survived on my proceeds from the party source and on contract distilling for f- until we had our own whiskey to sell. Yeah, absolutely. So contract distilling, is it still a part of, of what your, your daily business is? Diminishing well? all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of the contract distilling was to survive until we became until whiskey could be four or five years old. It served that purpose. It was maybe about 45% of our budget and allowed us to be completely full, which a, a distillery mm-hmm. of in production, but a distillery is much better when it's running you know, at full steam than turning it on and turning it off, uh, the equipment and so forth. So uh, it served that purpose, and gradually we're, we're getting out of the as we can afford to, we're getting out of the contract distilling and taking back all those barrels for our own. Your own, our own stock, use. your yes. own aging and everything so, like that. Yeah, we're doing a little bit and we'll do less every year. So four years was kind of your, your mark when, when New Rift started coming out. Was it four because you felt like it was ready or was it four because you said, I think this is to the point where we don't have to worry about like at this point. We don't have to worry about putting age statements on the bottle, you know, by TTB law. So what was the, what was the idea on four there? And, and were you nervous? Yes, I was nervous, of course. Um, Jay Erisman is the answer. Jay, again, is, is our co-founder and fantastic and uh, brings that knowledge. Uh, and Jay's idea, which I bought into and the rest of the team did, from the beginning was let's not release any whiskey till it can be bottled in bond. Jay's a historian and he's a lover of things past. He's very, very smart about the future too, of course, and and, and current distilling, but uh, felt that the, you know, years ago he felt that the bottled in bond was, was ripe for revival and that the original, the first federal uh, law about food and, and drug purity in the United States was about alcohol in 1897, the Bottled and Bond Act. And Jay felt that the incipient, incipient um, uh, revival of Bottled and Bond was a fantastic movement, and we wanted to be very much a founding member of that. So we always intended to wait to be at least four years old. And then along the way, we were very, very pleased with Larry Ebersold's help to, to be tasting things as you go along. And things were moving well. We liked our juice. And we liked the way it was aging. So along the way, we realized that uh, getting to be at least four years old, we were going to have a very credible whiskey out there. And I, wanted to, and I made sure that it was at a very credible and easygoing price. Because again, as a retailer, I understood marketing and sales and, and pricing and uh, wanted our whiskey to come out at a premium level in pricing, which it deserved as a, and also as a brand marker, but uh, wanted to always make it an appropriate fair price. One, one click above the, the global heritage companies, but not, not at the kind of pricing that I always found repugnant as a retailer, and I certainly did as a consumer as well. Mm-hmm. And, and not only that, as I mean, you, you come out with this, the four-year-old product, and right away, it starts like kind of taking over a lot of the the bourbon culture and the bourbon uh, mind share because everybody's amazed 
uh, at the taste of a four-year-old product. I don't think there's a lot of, or really there's any other product out there today that can really say that it, it competes of what new Rift does at its, at its age. Like, is there something well, that you can, you that. that you can attribute that to? Sure. Or what I kind mean, of magic num- sprinkled dust that you're putting yeah, on the, the barrels Yeah, the magic sprinkled dust is the water. <laughs> yeah. It really is, Kenny. And, and, uh, that's a nice story too, because when we first started when we planned and we're very close to breaking ground on the distillery, we didn't know about our water source. Our water source, uh, uh, turned out to be, um, uh, an aquifer, the Ohio River aquifer, uh, 100 feet under under the distillery property. And we didn't know about it when we first started planting. But along the way, someone said something to Jay, you know, you know, there's, there's a lot of water. Are you guys going to do a well? And Jay ran with it. He's smart enough to, to listen and, and think, hmm, you know, and that's Jay's personality. I mean, he's a scientist and interested in everything. And he thought, I'm going to find out what the heck's under us. And we did. We did a, we, we ran a test well. And then worked with the University of Kentucky to, to analyze and understand what was going on underneath us. So geologically, it was just turned out to be a, a bonanza uh, because the, the aquifer in brief, and I'm, I'm no STEM person myself, so forgive me, um, but the aquifer essentially is a pool, a, 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 a almost inexhaustible pool of water under the, the far northern part of northern Kentucky. And it's created because the glacier stopped and created uh, the Ohio River and created the hills of Cincinnati. And that geologic force continues to this day to pump wa- to push water under the Ohio River. And it's going through sand, silt, and guess what? Limestone. And then northern Kentucky from our site, uh, right on the river, you go straight up hills to go into southern Kentucky uh, or to get away from northern Kentucky. So as you go south, it's going uphill. So we're in a bowl. And, all, and as you look and you see the highways and the rock along the highways where they do the cuts and the passes and so forth, it's all limestone rock. So it's all coming from two directions and settling, and it's under us in this magnificent, huge aquifer under our feet. And it turned out we did all the testing, and it came in, and it's magnificent limestone filtered, naturally filtered water. It's, it had no lead, which is you know the, 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 the great thing. It's high calcium from the limestone very high mineral content water, and it's 58 degrees year round. So we don't have to have a cooling tower. We're a very environmentally healthy and, and, and successful distillery. And that water, that putting that mineral water right into our mash bill, and you can drink it, we've all drunk it. It's just hard water, hard water tastes like crap, but it's great for distilling. And I would contend, and obviously if someone's gonna jump up out of this microphone and wanna choke me, but I would contend <laughs> that believe it or not, Northern Kentucky, New Riff, has the best water in Kentucky for distilling. Because the, the, the fact of the matter that the marketing people don't want you to know is that almost every other, and perhaps every other, significantly sized distillery in the state of Kentucky uses city water or river water. And then they filter the hell out of it, turn it mm-hmm. into RO water. So they're putting into their mash bills, whatever they're tell, showing you in your advertising, you know, what do you, you think it's coming from a some sort of wheel that's spinning in a lake yeah, or something like absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. And this wonderful spring and, and all that, which long ago they outgrew, you know, the whole thing. But, you know, I mean, Buffalo Trace Pulse in the Kentucky River, you know, the, the Brown Foreman Pulse from Louisville Municipal Water. I can go on and on and on. And I'm not, I'm not slamming them in any way. They make fantastic whiskey. But we are bringing a natural, high mineral content, awesome water into our mash bill. And God... Darn it, I think that's, when you only have like three ingredients going into your mash bill and one of them changes dramatically, that means something. And then you layer on that, Kenny, you know, the, the, the fact that we're all about quality at every turn and, you know, the, the corn comes from a family farm, the same one that Four Roses uses in Indiana. And we can go on and on and on. We, we come off the still at less than the maximum. We go into the barrel at 110. Instead of the legal maximum of 125, we use 18 and 24 months aged, uh, you know, oak staves instead of the standard, you know, barrel and at a hundred dollars more a barrel than other people. We can go on and on and on. It's all mm-hmm. about quality at every turn, but it starts with that water. So there are very good reasons. It, it's not by chance that our four-year-old, thank you for saying so, I think is a very good product and you're going to want to get to this. It's going to be fantastic when it's seven, eight, and 10. Oh yeah. That's what we'll, we'll save that here for a second. Cause I kind of want to know your, your plans for the future with that. But you know, back to this, you know, let's, let's rewind it back another 15, 20 years or maybe 25 years. 
when you bought the the location of the party source, is it you look at it now like ah, just dumb luck? Yeah, I mean, I bought the, the, the land and, and the distillery, for your listeners who don't know, the distillery is right in front of the party source. And we're mm-hmm. right on right on the river across from Cincinnati. You, you can't get any closer to Cincinnati. But that was the point of the retail store because Ohio had state stores and 80% or more of our customers came from Ohio. And that's why the party source grew to be such a large store. It's, a, it, it's a, unnatural for northern Kentucky, but it's because we had all of Cincinnati coming to us. So... And then when I wanted to do the distillery, the original plan was just, gee, this is a nice, I own, the, I own some property, and that's another story, too. I actually had to take out a levee and build a, a, a wall, a flood wall and so forth, million-dollar flood wall in order to get more property. But the point was I thought it would be a great location, very well-known, right in front of the party source, and there was a symbiosis symbiotic relationship you know people could come on a tour to see us and then walk into this fantastic whiskey store and shop and it's turned out to be like that but dumb luck in terms of the water absolutely dumb luck Mm -hmm. it's just like being in texas and somebody knock on your door and be like you got oil in your backyard we'd like to buy your land yeah Yeah, and you just scratch under your armpits and go oh i'll be damned (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk a bit um, about like the little of the future state, right? Because sure. today we uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's a lot of four year product. There's people like myself. We go we do barrel picks here, yep. and it's a four year product. And I know that a lot of people we love it as is. Um, however, there's always this um, oh, I can't wait until it's six, mm-hmm. it's eight, sure. it's ten years. So kind of talk about what your your future plans are to just kind of stock some of these barrels sure. away. Sure. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a, but, but first of all, it is a great ride. And the, and the four year old, the bottle and bond is a, is a wonderful product. And we'll never release any product from our distillery, any whiskey that's uh, less than bottled and bond, four year and, and, um, and, and hundred proof. And, or it'll be barrel proof. It'll mm-hmm. be one of the two. So, and that's the way we've been and that's the way we'll always be. Uh, Cause we think that's, we, we think that's the highest quality expression and that's what we're all about to, to hopefully become one of the great small distilleries of the world. Which, by the way, even if we fall short, hey, it's great. I mean, life should be about lofty goals and, and trying your damnedest. And, you know, if we fall short and, you know, we're, we're not quite there, it still was a worthy endeavor. But signs are decent that we might, we've taken a few steps in that direction and we might just get there in 10 or 12 years in some form of recognition from the public and writers and our own self-assessment. But you really, of, you really of, don't want to retire, do you? No, I actually, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to stick around. The honest truth is I'd like to stick around long enough in an extremely active role. We'll stay a family business. My daughter's in the business. Everybody here is career. We're not selling out. We're not going to, we have no interest in, in one of the big boys buying a minority share. We're, we're surviving. We're getting through the roughest part right now. Uh, economically, and we're going to stay 100% independent because that's really the only way you can really achieve greatness is, is having incredibly long-term thinking and just be totally disinterested in short-term results. So, and having that freedom of, of uh, without any corporate decision making because whatever anyone says, nothing will change. We're going to buy you out. Nothing's going to change. None of your people are going to change. Everything's the same. Everything's different a year later. We all know it. It's just it's a fact out there. So, we're going to stay independent and. And that's very important. So we've taken some steps. I mean, I think the fact, Kenny, that I'm sure you're aware we went out to in our very first competition we ever went to, because, again, why go to all these little county fairs or whatever just so you can say award winning? Nobody, it doesn't mean anything to the, like your listeners. And those are the people that we really care about that will establish our reputation. So we waited. We think like a lot of people that the San Francisco International Spirits Competition is the main um, spirits competition. It's an arguable issue, but... Uh, certainly one of the top couple. We think it's the... the you came home with a few one. medals from it. So. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we uh, uh, submitted all five of the products we make, three whiskeys and two gins, and all five of them won double gold. Mm-hmm. You know, it's unheard of. It's, it's like going to the Olympics and just like... It's having crazy. A clean, I mean, clean to sweep. put it in context, and, 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 and I'll asterisk this real fast and, and backpedal, but, you know, this year, factually, Buffalo Trace submitted... Uh, 21 entries and got seven double goals. New Risk submitted five entries and got five double goals. We are not the equivalent of Bubble, Buffalo Trace. Far better distillery. Uh, you know, and they are, in my opinion, the best in, in the business. But the, the thing is, w- we've taken a step toward that goal. We, we, you know, so we feel very encouraged to have some exterior validation. 
and it's so we're not just in a circle, mm -hmm. you know, uh, talking to each other about these things. So anyway, we've started to take a step now to get back. And sorry that sometimes I run on, but uh, it's a very passionate subject. Uh, we know to to put out the very best whiskey uh, that we can, and to really have a a, a, a very high world reputation as good as our four-year-old is and as fairly priced as we will always keep it, we have to have older whiskey. So we've, this year, I mean, it's all, it gets back to a matrix of economics. Uh, our first year of release, we held back only, we held back 20% of everything we make to get older. Um, next year, we're budgeted for 33, a full third of everything we make to, to get older. And um, what I will say now, which, is actually the first time I've ever seen this publicly. So it's a credit to the the, the reach that, that that you guys have and the uh, the interest and the uh, astuteness of your listeners. Uh, we're actually going to do a small expansion of the distillery. Oh, fantastic. And we'll get back to that if you want. But the point that I want to make right now is the only purpose of that expansion is not to make more four-year-old or not to make some more money in the short run. It's to have older whiskey and a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So we are going to make a stand toward older whiskeys. We'll always have a great four-year-old, a bottled and bond product at an extremely fair price. It may not go up in price for 10 years. It could stay at $40. Fine with me. And then eventually we'll have a very fairly priced, we'll have older whiskeys. And personally, we'll see if things change. I'm all for age statements. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. think again. And and. This is really where the future of New Riff is going to be, is, is older whiskeys. A great entry level um, that is fantastic for cocktails, and it's just fantastic for, for sipping on without talking about it. But it'll be the seven-year-old, the eight-year-old, maybe 10-year-old, and whatever, in, in, very, in, in everything that we make mm -hmm. getting older that will put us on the map and will really, I think, make us proud. And, and I think your listeners are going to really want to have someday. And we're going to try and have enough of it that it's not this high cult, high scarcity kind of item. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it'll be on a shelf, but we want to make, have a lot more out there, you know, thousands of cases of older whiskey uh, and not just dribble it out to people. Makes more people, or it makes more sense for people to start joining the Rangers program then, so they get those those inside well, details. Well, the, uh, so. the Rangers program has ended, but the whiskey Oh, has it? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. we, we, we ended the Rangers program when we brought out whiskey. It was a four-year oh, okay. program. So if you're in, your grandfather did, and that's great, but we do have a whiskey club that's, that's right. worth joining. Well, and that's the whiskey club will give people early notification, but um, I, I, people will find our product and as, as we start releasing some of these older things within a, a couple of years. Well, while we start wrapping this up, I know you okay. brought something with us to, to, to try and taste, and I've got, a, I've got one more kind of like fun question for you too while, sure. we, uh, while we start talking this, but also kind of tell me what we are going to be drinking. Yeah, here. well, the background is just, and very briefly, um, we're cautiously and carefully doing some really interesting things. So we're focused right now on our, on our bourbon and rye, and we think we make phenomenal products. Um, we have some really interesting things, Kenny, in the barrel. Um, and as they start coming out in the next uh, few years, and then we'll keep a lot to get older, these will go a long way to establish our reputation too. Now, having said that, we do not want to be Baskin and Robbins 31 flavors. Mm -hmm. You know, we are kind of purists, and we're, we're, we've got it. We want to do a new riff on, on the old tradition. But we believe in that old tradition, so we're not going to get far afield. You're not going to get a, uh, you know, you're not going to get a uh, lollipop whiskey out of us. <laughs> you know, we're not going to throw. We're not particularly fond of. We think it's gone. The, the industry's gone overboard on, on second on second barrelings. Uh, there is finishes, a lot of that going on, yeah. You know, and I, it can cover up. It can mask, you know, traditional flavors, and we're not big on it, and we're not going to really do that. But we have some really interesting things, and and what we have, so. Uh, look for look for those coming down the pike, but this is one I wanted to share with you. This will be part of the whiskey club in the fall in November, um, and this is a Balboa rye. So Balboa yeah, like is tell a, me what Balboa is. That's that's the first part. Yeah, well Balboa, and again I'm not the expert. We should have Jay <laughs> Arisman here, and Kenny, you know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but Balboa is what heirloom okay. uh, 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 variation of rye, and our rye is made. Uh, from European rye, because at the moment we think that's still the, the, the best that there is. Uh, it comes from Sweden or it comes from Germany. Um, 
And, but this is a rye that's made by our farmer, uh, the Charles Fogg family in Indiana, about 120 miles from here. And he's always grown a little bit of it as a cover crop. Well, uh, right five years ago, four years ago, he, he provides us our corn. And um, we talked to him and he agreed to start making, to growing some more Balboa rye because mm-hmm. we wanted to do an heirloom rye. And so every year we've done more because as we're tasting this in the barrel, everybody's just super pumped about it. I mean, it's, it doesn't have a typical rye characteristics of like dill or spearmint or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's orange zest. You get some little bit of like cacao or chocolate notes with it. It's, it's unlike any other kind of rye. And you know, you're tasting it. This is 110 or 111 proof. It doesn't even have it on our sample bottle, but it's, there's no water on this. You can try, I would actually suggest trying just a little hint of of uh, purified water. I can do a little bit of water in it too, just to yeah. kind of... It kind really, of t- it opens it up. You know, there's a thermic reaction and it's it's uh, very important to, to taste I'm first. Add a without, little bit more to, to it now. Then to try a little, then to try and try it with a little purified water or RO water. But uh, uh, I, I think this is a really exciting product. And it's it's interesting too, because as your listeners well know, uh, terroir is a, mm-hmm. is, a, is a big deal in our industry. And, you know, having arrived from Indiana and it's an heirloom grain, and then putting this down and trying it against, for instance, our regular rye of the same age, is there's astonishing differences. Yeah. And it's really exciting. So again, I think New Riff is going to be known particularly for our rye and our rye expressions, and this is the first of of, uh, uh, more to come out of the barrel that'll be different ways of expressing rye, and I think people are going to be really, really excited to try them as the years go on. I think you're right. I mean, you're you're definitely hitting a home run here. There's something new. It's innovative. It doesn't have a typical rye profile. Oh, absolutely. That is good. So, so while you we, can take that home. <laughs> oh, even better. I'm not going to say no to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do, do, I'll do that as well. perks for doing yeah, this. absolutely. And you're I'll, not I'll doing sh- it for the box. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of work that goes into yes, it. That's for sure. You deserve it. So uh, kind of last question as we wrap this up, kind of fun one. Sure. You know, a lot of people do these single barrel picks, and I know you see them. You get the stickers that come out. You've got riffomania mm-hmm. um you've got ken riffy jr i mean yep. uh the riffler there's right. there's all these kind of like fun plays with the word riff in it like what, what's your kind of thought on the sticker sticker game with the new riff well you're barrels? you know we're going to conclude on a controversial subject but that's okay <laughs> you've got sophisticated listeners they're used to this uh, this is actually a topic a hot topic of discussion in the industry mm-hmm. i will tell you exactly our position let the chips fall where they will on the one hand i certainly understand once someone or clubs or retailers have purchased our product, they own it. Mm-hmm. It's theirs. On the, that's, so I understand there can be adulterations to our packaging. On the other hand, our position is we've gone to tremendous lengths and tremendous expense. And by the way, I hope you like our packaging. We, we think we've really hit a home run on it. And you don't see a whole lot of gradient bottles out there, do yeah, you? I think it's just beautiful. And, and of course, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, you know, have a perspective about that. But, you know, our position is we've done a huge amount and our brand and our market marketing um, and our public image is everything to us. We're trying to be one of the great small distilleries of the world. So as our packaging is adulterated uh, in the marketplace and maybe a less savvy consumer than your listeners uh, looks at it, they may not know that we didn't do that. Mm-hmm. And there's a copyright infringements going on. Uh, there's off-color kinds of things being done with stickers and so forth. So the position of New Riff, and I'm sure many others, and I know we're going to sound like fuddy-duddies. And, no, and, I mean, it's quite and, all right. And, and, there's a, know, I mean, coming from the brand side, there's a, lot, not, there's a lot of time that is yes, invested and into we're, it. We're, so we're not happy about it. But at the other hand, we understand that we don't have a particular control over it and we just hope we're glad people are excited about whiskey um, and we hope that people will understand that we didn't do it Mm -hmm. (laughs) absolutely well i mean it's it's good to get that take because i know that 
it's from from the enthusiast point of view, you always want something that differentiates it yes. or something that kind of like puts that own little umph to it. And you all actually do that already with your single barrels. You can get your logo put on the side. We, you we can do. you can you can actually put whatever it is that you want in there. You can put the tasting notes. You can put whatever it is that you want to call yeah. it on the side. So you've you've yeah. gone ahead and, and done a lot of that branding. We too. have, but it's very very brand. It's on brand mm-hmm. what we allow to be done to our bottle. And uh, a lot of what's going on out there is very clever and, and, and very enjoyable in, in, on one perspective. But if you, you know, if you own a brand and you're building a brand, you can see where uh, it would be irksome. And we, we, um, um, you know, but again, we don't have control over it, and we're glad for the enthusiasm. Absolutely. And uh, if you, if there's a choice between putting some some sticker on a on a bottle, you know, or not, we just soon it was a. I guess I suppose. Out of talking out two sides of my mouth, I'm glad you want to do it on a new riff bottle. <laughs> There's enough of a salesman, uh, you know, and a guy that has to pay the bills to say that. Absolutely. So, Ken, I want to say thank you so much again for coming sure. on the show, uh, sharing your story, sharing really like a, 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 a how I built this kind of thing. Because, you know, for a lot of people out there, they listen to the show. There's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit too, mm-hmm. and understanding you know, the ups and downs that you went through, the lucky breaks, the aquifer, all that sort yep. of stuff, how it all really came together to, yes. to really build, uh, you know, what, you, what you're currently building. And it's good to see that you're not just going to be resting on your laurels. You've well, got thanks. big plans for the future. And we're all excited to kind of see where this is going to go. We do. And, and, and just to finish on that note, and uh, sorry if this is a little self-aggrandizing, but hey, it's the world we live in. I think, honestly, I can say, and transparently I can say, there's a purity, purity of the motivation of everybody, including particularly myself, mm-hmm. for what New Riff is about. If it was only about money, I never would have sold the party source. Uh, we're trying to achieve something else here, and uh, I think we're trying to be one of the great small distilleries of the world. We will not be one of the most profitable distilleries of the world. They don't go hand in hand, and I'm proud of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that's that's fantastic, and I'm, like I said, it, it really shows to the character of what this is, and if you haven't had a chance yet, I know that the expansion of getting New Riff into to more states is, mm-hmm. is continually happening. I know that you've got partners that are based in Washington, D.C. now, so they can get them in other states that don't necessarily have mm-hmm. distribution, so it's good to see that this is starting to really make its way out there into the market. So congratulations Thank so you. far on your Thank success you. and, for me. Uh, and all the best for the future. Um, if there's any way that you want to or kind of wrap this up for people to, you know, give a location of, of the distillery, like where should they go to kind of check out more information and stuff like oh, that? Oh, sure. Too. Thank you for that. I mean, we're right here in Newport next to Cincinnati. So a couple of things real quick is, you know, if you're visiting Kentucky, a real smart way to do it is to go in or out of Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, the airport's actually in, in Kentucky, and then Louisville, or Lexington for that matter. So you, instead of making a circle, you just make a, uh, you know, you start one place and end in another. So Cincinnati's a great destination, the Party Source is a great whiskey store, and then Louisville, of course, and Lexington have wonderful uh, whiskey uh, tourism aspects. So visit us, but you know, as you're visiting Central Kentucky and visiting Louisville, and then um, all I can say is that uh, we really look forward to having a lot of older product out there and keep on working with people like your listeners to keep building uh, you know, the reputation of New Riff and, and, and doing things the right way and supporting all the distilleries that are coming along, uh, including the Heritage guys that are, I think are fantastic, uh, that are doing things the right way. Absolutely. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I know that New Riff is all over the social media channels, too. So go check them out on uh, the Twitter and the Facebook and all its places, too. Also, make sure you're following Bourbon Pursuit everywhere. And if you do like what you hear, make sure you support the show, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. So, Ken, thank you so much again for joining us. And we'll see everybody next week.